I'd been living in summer, you know, until I'd turned at least 28. I'd had summer, I'd had a nice happy life and no great interruptions and this kid at 10, it's like, wow, I'm about to, you're, you're about to sample winter in a really big way and I, I just didn't, and the counsellors, everybody was advising me that it was really important to include him and it was, my greatest learning was that in sharing the information with him, the sharing of daddy, daddy has, has cancer, that word cancer is a really scary word for anybody, let alone a child. And I, rem and I, and I, and I said, to, he was looking down, we were in the car at the time and, and he looked up and he looked at me and he went, mum, we just have to cope and hope. We just have to cope and hope. And he became, in a way, this little um, uh, little little Buddha throughout the whole experience. And in the end, he sort of facilitated his death. You You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who, in their right mind, would accentuate anything else? Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. Welcome to Accentuate the Positive here on Soul Traveller Radio with Karen Swain. I've got a fascinating guest for you today on the show, Ellie Bradbury, who's a producer, <laughs> who's a producer, mm -hmm. campaign manager, director, who brands critical issues. Well, look, you know. She's got a million hats on and she's got a fascinating story, a really transformative story. Hello, Ellie. Great to have you on the show. Hey, Karen. Hello, everyone. Thank you, to ha thank you for having me on the show. Now, your story, you've been, oh, you've been up to so much. I tell you, you've been through such a journey. And I love, and I love, I love telling people's journeys because I really feel that in our, mm. when we share our story, we yeah. really allow, we really hear our own story and other people's stories and, you know, we can learn from the wisdom that you've learned. But how did you get into uh, social, you know, social branding, critical issues? It's a story that stems from a history as a television producer. So I spent a good 15 years as a casting director, television producer, studio executive and the experience in that world is to tell story and to um, ultimately find in, in that world um, happy endings were generally speaking the, the, the driver and as I was working for an, um, an international studio one of the key issues was well Interviences respond really well to real stories, true stories, things that have happened to people. So at that point, I was working on stories like the Stuart Diver uh, reenactment, or there was another woman who was an Olympic skier whose story we reenacted and we re dramatized. And I became quite fascinated in telling other people stories at end, you know, and you get to explore these worlds that people occupy that are so far removed from your own. And 15 years working on other people's stories, I arrived at a point, I took um, a maternity break and decided, well, I've got to go back to work, but I feel I've really exited at a high point uh, of that industry. And I felt I'd done everything I had gone there to do. And I, I, I had no idea how I could parlay those skills into something useful and meaningful. And I'd been working on a slate of projects. and I'd had like a million dollars just to spend on developing projects, just to develop um the possibility of a television show, whether or not it went to air, we don't, it was irrelevant, but we had a million dollars to spend on engaging a producer and a writer. And I, and I arrived at a point after my maternity leave where I wanted to do something really meaningful with those skills. And I was approached by Tim Costello at World Vision through a mutual friend. And because I had been a casting director and worked um, with very high profile people, they wanted to build an ambassador and to um, engage profile people and leverage their uh, profile to bring attention, public attention to critical issues. And it just became this perfect fusion of 
my skill set, my contacts, my ability to tell story, narrate story. And yet this time I had to take these profile people out into the world to um, very high, I, I call it taking high value people to low value places. And within that fusion comes some fascinating adventures. So I took people like Hugh Jackman across Thailand and Cambodia and into Ethiopia and we met with prime ministers and presidents. We invested investigated fair trade and um, I took Rebecca Gibney to Malawi to investigate um, maternal child health. I took Fifi Box off to Bangladesh to investigate community development and, and, and then Melissa Doyle from Sunrise off to Armenia. We went and in, investigated institutionalised care for children in the region and it went on from there and I took High Five to the Philippines and I sort of got into this model and it, it grew from there and so I came to understand that whereas in television production you can manipulate the story and you can manipulate the story before you start making it. In this situation, I had to fly by the seat of my pants and find the story, but I had people with me who were used to working from a script where you know, we knew the outcome and we knew what was required of them and we had no idea from one day to the next what would occur. And so I became really adept at finding a way into critical issues with very high-profile people, educating them, finding subject matter experts, translating the issue and positioning them to then run home with that life experience, having touched that critical issue and report on it. And so we would build campaigns in the background, but because they'd had that experience speak from their heart, not necessarily as a subject matter expert, but certainly from their heart. That's how, that's how it all evolved. Look, I tell you, you've been a busy gal. You've been a very busy gal and uh, ooh, one of those difference makers that is behind the scene. But, you know, what I find so fascinating with these difference makers who are behind the scene, you've got your own story which is transformative. <laughs> I mean, it's all very well putting mm. celebrities in front of cameras and taking them to Cambodia and looking at... Yeah. And that is a fascinating thing because... I've just finished interviewing Michael Margolis who has a business called Get Storied and he is very much about helping people translate stories that make a difference into a world so that people can actually hear them. And the conversation that we had was very much about how charity throws the story of the problem in front of you first before it, before it gives you the oxytocin, you know, hit where you feel good. It, mm. shows, you, it shows you what's going wrong so you feel bad and, and overwhelmed and then it sort of says, well, this is what happened and this is what's going right and then you get the oxytocin hit. And he was saying that's actually backwards because we're so used to seeing this, the problems of the world thrust in our face through media and internet and on the television mm. that we become numb to it and we don't want to feel bad and so we turn it off before we get to the oxytocin hit. So he was saying, yeah, get story. It's all about translating a story of possibility and hope and change right at the beginning. Mm. Mm. And uh, I think television has been doing that, you know, the the old way for a long time, like the, the problem and then giving you the hit. But back to what I was going to say, like, I often find these... But you raise a good point, Karen. You, you raise a really good point because I call it the need and the hope. So you have to, you have to communicate the need and usually the need's dire in most cases. In most stories, for there to be hope, it's born from a need. You create hope. You give birth to hope because there is a need for it. And I, I, without a need, there is no need for hope. Does that, do you know what I mean? And I think that's a really good point that he raises. But I think and often that's where our personal growth comes from as well. Well, it does, do you, it does. But, you know, you if, know? You see, if you see someone doing something amazing, like drawing something, a painting or singing, it's a bit like the voice, which I'm totally into. I was a plug for the voice. You know, you don't see the person. Mm -hmm. You hear their beauty before you see them. And you hit, and mm. so you get the oxytocin hit before you see the problem. And I think that's a beautiful way of telling a story because you, you, you're, you know, taken by the beauty, and and then you see that oh my mm. god, they have no arms and legs, or you know, they're poor, mm. and you know, they're homeless or whatever, and you go wow. Mm. But the beauty struck you first, and then you go into like, how did they get to this beauty? 
in such dire circumstances. So that's, I think that's what Michael is trying to it's allude. True. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But anyway, I, what I find I is, you, you know, the people behind the scenes have the most inspiring stories and this is what I'm doing here today, yeah. darling. I want to tell your story. <laughs> you know, I know what Thank you've you. been doing for others and we're going to get more into that because you've got, great things on your plate right now but I really want to get into your story let me tell people how I met Ellie Bradbury so we were introduced through mutual friends and you would talk to me lovingly about your mother and how you adored your mother and and how she was a professional psychic and I was like wow what was it like growing up with a mother who's a professional psychic and we would discuss that and and the way you spoke about your mother was so heartwarming I just felt I have to I have to meet this woman. I have to meet this woman. But she wasn't living <laughs> in Sydney at the time. She was living in London or Perth or somewhere. Mm. And by a complete synchronistic event, someone rang me years later and said, do you want to come to a psychic house party? And I said, no, because I work also as a psychic and I need psychics mm. to tell me what, you know, what they get. And, she, and I said, mm. tell me who's doing it. And she <laughs> said, Pam Bradbury. And I said, no way. And so as life would answer my desire, because the desire was I, I want to meet your mum, you know, I met your mother, mm. we became friends, and that's how I started in radio. She actually got me in radio. She, mm. she pushed me forward when I said, I'd like to be on radio, spread nice messages. She said, let's do it. And so <laughs> there was this fabulous story there going on. Mm. And, and you went off and did a whole lot of things were happening or where do we start with your story? Where do we start? I know. Oh, where do we start? Well, I think it's possibly also worth mentioning. I think, I think my story is one of resilience. You know, if you wanted to, to bring it down to a, a key word that has significance for me, resilient, the driver. And I, I never into I always I always remember thinking as a kid in my 40s 40s are going to be my best years they're going to be fantastic and in fact my 40s have been the most challenging time of my life and in actual fact they've been the making of me and um, I'm almost across the bridge of resilience and have almost arrived at the other side and my story I suppose it starts with bearing witness. As we talked to before, I, I was out in the world bearing witness to other people's pain and suffering and I met some incredible people in tribes and various places who taught me through to sharing their own stories how they had rebuilt their lives. And I was there with a camera observing it and often wondering, why am I here? Why am I watching this? What's this about? And in 2012, I had an accident and I had a spinal injury. And in actual fact, the accident itself is quite entertaining. It's really funny. I don't know if I've told you this story, Karen, but I was in Brooklyn and I was with, I'd taken five children to um, the museum and a small child in my group had climbed a statue. A security guard had said, get the child off the statue. You have to get the child off the statue. And she was quite high up the statue and I had a camera strapped across my back, but like a Hasselblad camera. And I went to grab the child, um, Poppy, and I fell backwards with the child in my arms and landed on the camera on my spine. Mm. And my black back became completely numb and immediately and he said don't move an ambulance came um, we called my girlfriend my girlfriend and I we ended up in this hospital ward in Brooklyn and I had a brace on I was strapped to the bed I wasn't able to move and we arrived into this hospital and it's mayhem there's police everywhere we're wheeled into this um, cubicle and my girlfriend who's a calls herself the Duchess of Brooklyn that give you an insight to kind of personality she is and she stormed out what was going on and it turned out that all the local prisoners from the local jail had been wheeled in to have all their minor you know cuts and bruises and whatever attended to and there I was in the middle of this and I couldn't move and it was the beginning of what would become me becoming imprisoned of myself. So it was a really interesting moment when I reflect on being in, in that cubicle with these prisoners on either side of me and then what happened following, which was that by the time I got home, we had surgeons with uh, sitting, meeting, trying to determine the best solution for me and there was a 50% chance that I would be able to walk again uh, without a, a limp or without aid and I was in so much pain we eventually discovered that I had bone splinters had catapulted into my spinal cord so 
following a few weeks of waiting to determine what was the right course of action, they, they performed this apparently high risk surgery and and I came out of that without any knowledge or we, we, we did not know whether I would be able to walk again. And it took three months of me lying in bed, staring at the ceiling and just hoping really. I had to, I had to, I had to, I went on this journey of, I remember looking up to the corner of the room and watching the spider making this spider web. And, and I realized that the patience the spider had making this spider web while I was stuck in bed and I, I, th- I realized I've been a f- my life. I've been a fly buzzing from here to there to everywhere, searching, 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 observing, observing, observing. You know, I kept getting caught in other people's webs of stories and and work. And and I realized that with this injury, I was going to have to become a spider, and I was going to have to learn how to weave my own web, and I was going to have to learn how to draw what I wanted to me, rather than because I, I I had accepted that there was every chance I wouldn't function in my life the way I had before. So it was a big journey and it was really lonely. Um, It was really hard. It was really challenging. And I thought at the time, this is in 2012, I had to step away from work. And at the time I thought, I think this would be the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I had to navigate my way through it with my family around me. And I had a small child who was really quite distressed because he'd been told his mum was going to be paralysed or in a wheelchair. And I was just determined this wasn't going to happen. So I created this sort of board with um, a column for goals and a column for achievements. And the goals side, I'd written what I wanted to achieve by a certain date. And it would be things like can put my underpants on myself, can sit up for more than half an hour, can walk across the room without help can and they were all micro but that for my family they were really significant so my son was able to say mom look what you did you achieved and so eventually I got back on my feet and I just was on each individual task and 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 worked with the these these internal muscles and worked with this incredible physiotherapist and so it was I was out of action for 12 months and then I had a phone call from Deborah Lee would I be willing to come back to work and head up the adoption awareness campaign and I thought I don't really have much to say about orphans and and or adoption or it's not really my story it's not really but okay I'll come in and I'll I'll I'll, I'll be a part of this campaign and lead it for you and I was 6 months into this campaign and I really was only just walking again when I was called to the hospital to um, accompany my husband to discover that he'd been diagnosed with a terminal cancer and he was given three months to live and all of a sudden and I literally went from that meeting to the Prime Minister's house in Kirribilli the next day where these orphans were running across the lawns and the definition of an orphan is a child who's lost one or both parents. And all of a sudden, I discovered that I had this connection with these orphans and that it really hit me. Like in the sternum, my child was about to become an orphan. And it was a really powerful, incredibly powerful moment. And Deb was standing there and she knew that um, Jerome had been, and she knew Jerome from years back, had been given this terminal diagnosis. And we were all, you know, everyone was scurrying around to try and, you know, find that miracle cure. And because I understood pain management and I'd been through rehabilitation myself, I understood pain medication and palliative care was a place I hadn't been to, but I had to enter into that world. And so my husband went immediately went into chemotherapy and then he decided that he wanted to take this bucket list trip around the world. And the doctor said, this is a kamikaze mission. You have got to be joking. And he could die on the road. He had this tumour in his tonsil that had grown and it was really just going to grow into an artery and he would bleed out. And I said, well, this is what he wants to do. And I haven't worked in international aid and travelled out to crazy hokey places with evacuation plans and ambassador, you know, like dealing with the embassies and, and DFAT. I can do this. I know I can do this. And so all of our friends, my husband was an actor, and so they put on this fundraiser and you were there. And um, 
raised $50,000, which was an incredible thing because I'd been working in the not-for-profit sector. I'd been working in charity and I'd been working to give. And all of a sudden I had to stand on a stage behind, beside my husband and receive. And I, for me, it was a really powerful experience to... I'd always identified myself as a giver and for the first time I stood there, it, it was such a vulnerable experience to stand there and say thank you because when people want to give to you, you receive and you have to receive with grace and I felt this real responsibility to receive and do something that had significance without it needing to be measured but in a way that those people could see the value of their giving and it was such a general like in two hours fifty thousand dollars just landed in our lap and then with the next day we're sitting at the table counting the cash throwing it in the bank booking the flights packing the bags and I remember going into palliative care and being taught how to administer this medicine and I literally put this palliative care all this I had a backpack of drugs and I, and I to this point didn't even know whether I could sit on a plane because I'd only really learned to walk again and I finished the campaign for adoption awareness. We'd kind of already, you know, lobbied government and achieved some great stuff. So I stepped away from that. We put the boys on a plane. So my stepson, who was 24 at the time, and my son, who was 10, turning 11 at the time, we went. We went to Rome. We went to Turkey. We went to Istanbul. We went to Florence. We went to... It was the most horrific experience I have had because it was so touch and go. He nearly died a few times. Um, we had to revive him. We had all sorts of medical crises, but he was, he was such a giant and he just, he was determined and his purpose was to share the stories of those who've gone before him and before all of us. So he wanted to take his boys on this sort of historical tour. We were in and out of museums, we were in and out of galleries, we were in and out of, and it was crazy because I'd be up the night before, I'd have a map, I'd have the palliative care drugs that I'd work out right. That oxytocin will get us from Luca to Florence and then from Florence I'm going to need four patches and three and I'd sit there with a glass of wine and I'd map out drugs to kilometres, how we would get. And he was just, you have to get me to Istanbul, just get me to Istanbul. I have to get to Istanbul, I've got to go into... Um, he wanted, there was a particular place he wanted to go to. We managed to get him there. And, and it was about that point that he went, oh, that's it, this is it, this is the end of the trip. And so we flew him home and he went into radiation. And then I said, you know what, the barrier reef, the Great Barrier Reef, I just, I think it's important you haven't seen it. And it may be that we, we might not all be able to enjoy the Great Barrier Reef. So I organised a boat and he was very, very thin and very feeble at that stage. And I don't know what possessed me. We flew up and went sailing around the Great Barrier Reef and, yeah, he died about a month later. So that's, that's the story. <laughs> yeah, look, there's a lot more to the story than that. And um, Well, that's the story that, um, I mean, there are, there are so many, so many, there, so many layers to there's it. There's so many layers to the story. You know, Jerome was someone who was, uh, he was one of those actors that you knew his face but you didn't really know who he was, but he was in so many, mm. you know, I mean, maybe mm. if you're an actor in the acting industry you knew very well who he was, but he was as large as life. What I found interesting is that, you know, that journey that puts you on your spiritual path mm. and makes you ask questions about life, love and the universe and death and who are we, where do we come from, where do we go when we leave this body something that you were exposed to because of your mother mm. and uh, he'd had his own journeys through, mm. through contrast but still remained quite defiant in... Yeah, it was surprising to me because he went to St John of God and he went to St John of God twice. I know, in this, Brazil. Yeah, I know this is relevant to your, your listeners and I, I, it's probably not for everybody but as a conversation piece. And he was quite careful and cautious about how he relayed those experiences and one was a miracle cure deemed a miracle cure and the second was was probably really a pilgrimage um pilgrimage to this to to the deep core of himself and i you know we literally put him on that plane on my son's 11th birthday and, and i and i realized this would be the last birthday he would share with his son and he was determined to go to st john of god and as my son waved goodbye to him he said to me it's a long way to go to find peace 
It's yeah. a long way to travel to find peace, isn't it, Mum? And I thought, you know, what a what a generous kid. This is a kid who, you know, there's, there's the experience of telling a child their parents going to die, and I resisted this. I resisted it because, you know, for me, I my view is I'd been living in summer, you know, until I'd turned at least 28. I'd had summer, I'd had a nice, happy life and no great interruptions, and this kid at 10, it's like, wow, I'm about to, you, you're about to sample winter in a really big way and I I just didn't and the counsellors everybody was advising me that it was really important to include him and it was my greatest learning was that in sharing the information with him the sharing of daddy daddy has has cancer that word cancer is a really scary word for anybody let alone a child and I remember and I and I and I said he was looking down we were in the car at the time and and he looked up and he looked at me and he went mum we just have to cope and hope we just have to cope and hope. And he became, in a way, this little um, uh, little little Buddha throughout the whole experience. And in the end, he sort of facilitated his dad's death. He was really quite, he, he was very peaceful within the, he just accepted every part of it. And the more information he had as a child of 10 turning 11, the, the more he was able to process and he was given opportunities do you want to be a part of this or don't you want to be a part of it and and he was able to answer that very def, very definitively um yeah and it, so there are so many pieces that come with managing the end of someone's life especially when i mean there's a car accident experience or you know there's a sudden loss then there's the there's something like this where there's not much room for hope other than um, the minute you kind of come to terms with this is going to happen, we don't know when, but it's going to happen. So you, you start focusing on your legacy pieces. And I think, you know, the legacy piece is different for everybody. It is different for everyone. But I think one of the greatest sort of m most memorable moments in terms of legacy was when he asked, he had with his first wife and myself and our boys. So my husband had a son to you know, another woman who's a very dear friend of mine. We, we're, we're like, we are family. And he had us sitting around him and he said, you know, you all must hold hands because he'd been trying to draw this family tree. And like many people now, our family tree was so dysfunctional. And, and he said, don't make the mistake. Don't make the mistake I made. I, I didn't believe my family would be there for me when I hit difficult times. I always went to other people and if, if I'd gone to my family when I had hit difficult times, it would have been so much easier for us all. And he said, promise me, promise me that you will always turn to each other first before you go anywhere else with your problem. And so we have, and it's been, that's, I think, of all the pieces he wanted to leave with us that has been the most powerful. Yeah, he gave, he left us with a family, yeah which we didn't believe we had at the time, you know. But that's beautiful too because, you know, here's the thing about this story. Like I knew your husband before you knew your husband. Yeah, you did. <laughs> he used to come up. I had a shop. He used to come up and we'd go across to the cafe and talk and he told me his life story and he'd had this really difficult mm -hmm. time. And I also knew his first wife. And he told me his story of their marriage and she told me her story. You know, I got, I got the stories from all these different perspectives and it wasn't functional in any way, mm. shape or form. So, you know, the beauty that's come out of all of this is the love shared between all of you mm. Mm. and the connection and the family element coming from mm. such difficult times, really. And, uh, and that's... <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's, you know, because I think what I took, having had the time to reflect, as you do when you move through grief, the, I'd gone from functioning as a global citizen in a way through my work and had drawn from cultural tribal influences around family and community when I hit my own crisis. And then, so, so it kind of went from well, who, what are you prepared to do to be a global citizen and how do you position, function as a global citizen? And what do you, uh, without outside religion, outside of borders and politics, because when you hit a crisis within, within your own family, what are you prepared to do for your family? Because some people outsource a crisis. And I remember um, on one occasion, 
just feeling so overwhelmed by the entire experience and uh, almost ready to have, I, I think I was on the edge of a nervous breakdown and, um, and I grabbed my bag and I think it was one of those mornings where I'd handed Jerome a green smoothie and he said, I'm sick of that green smoothies. And, you know, we didn't have the same relationship with food. And, and I said, please just try the nutritional route. Just try, you never know. He said, I don't want to hear about the miracle cures. I'm going to do it my way. And that's the point at which I went, I have to accept you're going to do it your way you are going to do it your way and there's me interfering with that is me trying to control your your process the way you want to manage your life at the end of it so I grabbed my bag and I said I'm done I'm done I'm out of here and I walked out the door and I had this big yellow bag I remember it and I stormed towards the gate and I was about to lift this we were living in a place with this large gate and I heard my mother, my mother had been in the room, and I heard her, you know, she shouted my name out, Eleanor Bradbury, you get back here right now. And it was, you know, it's like she so stopped. It was like she was like Gandalf. And so I turned around and I returned and I stood before her and she said, I did not raise you to be a woman who walks away from, from her man at his hour of need, I did not raise you to be that woman. You get back in there and you face it and you face it head on. So I sort of walked back in and I went, oh, sorry. And he sat on one side of the table and I sat on the other and she sat between us and she pulled our hands together and she said, none of us have been here before. None of us have this experience that you are going to have. And she said, but you are going to be magnificent. And she said to me, you will be magnificent. And she looked at Jerome and she said, and you are going to show us how to be magnificent. And then she got up and she said, now I'm going to go and collect your son from school. And she walked out the door and left us there. And we were sitting there in silence and Jerome looked at me and he went, that was Oscar worthy. <laughs> Like, you know, oh Shirley MacLaine in terms of endearment. Oh, my God. You I will be that. magnificent. We are like, yes, we'll be magnificent. We will. We will. <laughs> From that point on, I tell you what, we were magnificent. That was Oscar worthy. I tell yeah. you what, she, you know, she had given you that message a couple of times on. Oh. Oh. Because... Um, you know, I remember we used to hang out at a friend's place down in Rose Bay, you know, Rose. Mm. And one of these days you were telling me about, about Jerome. I think you were, you were dating at the time. And Jerome, so he's a good-looking actor. He's got the world at his feet. And like many people with the world at their feet, you know, they try every candy in the candy shop. Mm. And he was doing exactly that. And mm. he was, had a reputation for being a bad boy and all that sort of thing. He was a bit of a Lothario, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and you were, you know, witnessing this right at the beginning and you were thinking, I, I am not up for that. You know, I'm not up for that. Mm -hmm. And he was doing some dysfunctional things and you're about to walk too. And she, you told me this story. Yeah, she did. She said the same thing to you. She said, I didn't raise a daughter to abandon someone in their hour of need because his bad behavior is more about a cry for help than mm. it is about you. Mm. And so that was something that, oh, I don't know, you're marriage to him kept with yes. you know he, yeah he, he it was a marriage of resilience karen and let me tell you there well, was a resilience lot of <laughs> but also to get back into that heart space mm. of i'm not here to run i'm here to you know i'm here to well, it's learning to accept you know yeah. one of the great great learnings from you know that was a relationship that was a marriage that took me through every single emotion and i think it was you who said oh god you know observing you when we were at that event you said it's such a rich relationship and yeah. i would agree with you i would absolutely agree with you incredibly rich and diverse and incredible. big in its expression and you know there were times when i became quite an angry person in response to that i became and then i managed i, I tried every tactic in the book i got um into okay we're not going to react we're going to learn to observe the way I, I'm going to observe the way I think and feel and uh, in response to this behavior because it's not the behavior it's the person I love not the behavior but yeah. um, the behavior was challenging it was really challenging for me mm -hmm. and, and I had to learn so many different techniques in order to um, 
to to exist within the relationship in a harmonious way so that and and at the time I thought am I compromising my my own needs and in actual fact I wasn't because he was my greatest teacher he was my greatest teacher absolutely absolutely yeah I learned from him more than I will ever learn from anyone ever again and you know someone said and I think it was my mother she said why do we why do we view a soulmate as someone who is a perfect harmonious match? Why do we do that? Why do we place that burden on a person to be our soulmate? Our soulmate is that person who recognises our great capacity and our capabilities and pushes us. Pushes your buttons. Pushes you to meet that or find that within you. And, I mean, I would never have gotten to the bottom of my well if I hadn't been with that man. I really wouldn't have at all. The entire journey has been, I, I, I think, my greatest career in a yeah, way. Yeah, absolutely. My, my greatest absolutely. career move. <laughs> absolutely. Look, Gary Zucroff. Bless from, him. <laughs> he's here. Gary yeah. Zucroff from Seed of the Soul says exactly that, you know, that your soulmate is the person that is going to push your button so hard. Because mm. here's the thing, you've come to earth as a being of love, you forget it and you, you come up with all these ideas about who you think you are and then your soulmate comes along and just reminds you who, that you, who you are not. Yeah, <laughs> and, so true because you know, I'm all perfect on the inside. <laughs> I certainly thought I was. He was there to remind me that I, there was some imperfections that we needed a bit of ironing out. And, you know, the good thing is if you're a listener, and I, I think we were always really good at sorry. We were really good at sorry. And my son has, when he was about five, coined this word, this new word, um, sorridge, he'd say. Sorridge. And we'd say, what's sorridge? He said, it's the, it's, the, it's the thing you do to let someone know you're really sorry. Not just the word, it's the thing you do. And, yeah, I think there was a lot of sorridge going on. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know what, it's got to be a great love if it keeps you there. And I think it, in, a, in many ways there was enough of the drama for me to now arrive at a point where, you know, stillness is the great counterpoint. So, you know, when you go through something, I mean, you know, Jerome's drama went with him right through to palliative care, right through to the end of his life. I know, some of the stories in hospital oh, where he would be oh. wake up and, and, you know, be reciting shank. Oh, like, I don't know, I can't remember. But I, I, oh, the, I remember the, he'd have this blanket and he'd throw it around his shoulders and he, because we'd been in Turkey, he'd wear a fez. <laughs> and he'd say, so who are my guests today? Are they big people or little people? And we'd use the curtains around his bed as theatre curtains and go, and today we have, oh, I don't know who it was. it was. We had everyone. We had everyone from Hugo Weaving to you name it, Miranda. They were all coming to say goodbye at different times of the night and day. And the drugs trolley would go past and it would be drugs. And you go, oh, yes, please, I'd like to try a new character today. <laughs> I know, never, never, ever a dull moment. Never, I never. And then at one point I get this phone call, I've gone to get some food and it's like, it's a code black, it's a code black and he jumped out of bed and he was pushing all the patients, you know, and we're talking palliative care, elderly, elderly people um, and um, he was pushing this woman in this bed towards the escalators, the elevators, sorry, and he was saving her life because they were about to steal her heart. And oh, everyone's heart here is going to be stolen. <laughs> and then he, at one point he came, he woke up and he jumped up. I mean, these are the drugs now, but he, they, they, you, you flash back and he kept flashing back to this character or this time where he'd been some hero in some really nasty gangster film. And so he'd wake up and he'd jump up on the bed and he'd go, quick, Greg, he'd say to me, <laughs> hey, get the guns and the drugs and let's run, run for it. <laughs> What are we doing now? You know, it was high. And as they said of palliative care, we have never, ever had a patient like him before. <laughs> look, <laughs> look, never a dull moment. He was absolutely, you know, living into the, yeah. to the, all the world is a stage, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what better place than in a, a hospital mm -hmm. where it's... Oh, like, yeah. And I remember he'd have this blanket on. And my dad, who's an engineer... <laughs> who's a really kind of salt of the earth, kind of um, water and soil and from the north of England. And he's there 
because we now need... We had to have two Ethiopian guards sit in, the, at the, in front of his door because he'd beaten up a few doctors and nurses. And, and so my dad was, sit, was had a chair inside the room and Jerome woke up with his fez and his blanket and got up and was walking down the, um, the corridor and my dad decided to kind of role play with him and he said so who are you today are you the queen of sheba and my father said there is no such play as the queen of sheba said no jerome said you know he was constantly you know no 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 i'm i'm richard the third i am or he was you know he was constantly role playing it was <laughs> challenging it was really challenging yeah you know the, the beauty of this story is to inside our challenges and inside the drama and inside everybody telling us how we have to stop being who we're being like stop being disruptive and stop being angry and stop being sick and all those stops all that resistance mm. that we incur on our journey is you know to step back and in, and enjoy that journey because it, it's so hard in the moment of the drama to to mm. to really in, enjoy the journey and and learn from it in the moment it's 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 easier in hindsight when you can look back on it but and and, and that's what i'd like to impart through this conversation mm. that the yeah. is rich the highs and the lows and the mm. lows you know bring from you that from the bottom of your well all your strength and your courage and your beauty and mm. um, but you know interesting just sort of to inject my personal part into this journey at the time that jerome was diagnosed um I was putting on a peace day event and, and I looked at, uh, across the planet and I thought, well, how do you get people interested in, in, in a subject such as peace, which is a kind of boring subject and the way people... Because it lacks drama. <laughs> so it lacks drama. And, yeah. And, you know, the, what people are interested in is, is celebrity. And I'm thinking, mm. okay, well, who do I know that knows a lot of celebrities? I'm like, aha, I know a couple of people. Mm. So I'm thinking I want to reach out to you guys, to Jerome and say, mm. you know, send all your celebrity friends to me so I can mm. get them talking about peace and peace day. And I thought I couldn't do it because you were going through your own journey. So just before Peace Day 2014, Jerome leaves the planet and you guys have this beautiful celebration of his life. Mm. So I turn up to celebrate his life with you and he's talking to me in spirit because every bloody celebrity in Australia was in that room. Right? <laughs> he says to me, you wanted celebrity car and I put him on a platter for you in yeah. one room. <laughs> Sure did. They were everywhere. It was. It was. Yeah. It was, and I was just yeah. like, "Thanks, Jerome." Like he said, I gave them. But what was really beautiful was I had never told you of my intent or what I was doing because mm. I just didn't feel like I could interrupt your journey. And of course, from spirit, where we have this broader perspective, we know what everyone's mm. thinking. So from spirit, he comes to me and he says, "You wanted them here. They are on a platter, all in one room for you." And I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, it's so <laughs> so Jerome's sense it's of so humor. Jerome, yeah, humor. So I asked a couple of them to do selfies for peace, to, to and, and they were very kind. But I just didn't think that it was a very appropriate time to ask people to sort of talk about peace day at somebody's celebration of life. But oh, I think you know. I, yeah, it's an interesting, it's interesting experience being um, observed like that as well. I think anyone who, you know, it's like your wedding day, you're observed and, and, and for those people who are in the public eye who are often observed, it's a really very confronting thing to be observed in, you, in your grief and, and also knowing the importance of determining the, the mood and the energy in in a room and it was really important to me that we celebrate his life and I knew that I, I had to lead that in a way and I had to sort of find a way to lead people to a lighter place because people arrive at occasions like that with an expectation of, of that they should portray sadness and sympathy but in actual fact you know that irreverence was to Jerome was. He's such an irreverent guy. He thumbed his nose and at, at um, and he was very idealistic in many ways. And it, we had to do something. So that's, yeah, we had to have an occasion. And so that's why I took all his books. He had about a thousand books and I did a pop-up library and handed all his books out to all his yeah. friends just to keep the memory because he, he loved to share stories. So coming back to the start of our conversation, he was a storyteller too. And so we shared his stories out with the world. Yeah. Mm. 
the ones he'd wow. read and loved. Yeah. That's what we're all doing here, really. We're just sharing our stories with mm. each other. I mean, that's... that's. Mm. But you shared a story with me, you know, recently um, about him coming to the realisation that his own physical story was coming to an end. Do you want to mm. share that? Um, yeah. You, you know, you took him to Esther and Jerry Hicks and John of God and Brazil. You know, you mm. were taking him down this path like... Mm. You, you'll find your healing in your soul and he's like ah bah humbug <laughs> there was a moment where yeah i remember we were in palliative care at one point and um he'd been writing a book for 10 years and um it had been i think in many ways writing it was his chapel it was his you know very sacred space and i kept saying go and get a publisher go and publish it go and publish it and he had spent so much time working on this book and to be honest with you, there were many occasions where I'd say, can you go and get a job? That would be really great at some point. No, 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 he was writing this book, writing this book. Anyway, um, so I, I tell you this because the book had, it was like another person in our relationship, you know, the book had, had occupied, holiday time had occupied, it was a significant, it was his life's work. Um, so we were in Luca on this, um, kind of manic kamikaze type bucket list trip and he started writing this blog and in fact from the moment he was diagnosed he kept this blog as a newsletter really for family and friends and we had thousands of people who started reading this blog because he was so open-hearted about his what he was experiencing and he and wondering and and what it felt like and because he was so, he, he was tired of people asking what did it feel like when you got your terminal cancer diet what did it feel like you know when you did it to do so and I was overwhelmed with phone calls so he had this blog and and so there was a lot of time devoted to writing the blog and finishing his novel and this sense of urgency 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 around these these projects and the th me and the boys w were very patient. We'd wait for him to be ready to start the day and, and or to do whatever he, it is he wanted to do. And because of his illness, we knew he wouldn't be able to, um, we wouldn't be able to take him out at night. So we would be hotel bound in the evening. So I'd ask Jackson, the eldest son, to bring a television show or something like with at least 100 episodes that we could, you know, watch over... Uh, you know it's five weeks at, at night so he bought Doctor Who and I I remember because I never really I mean I knew Doctor Who from my childhood but I hadn't really sat with Doctor Who back to back you know night after night and really observed the, the essence of Doctor Who but he's a Time Lord traveler right and and I found this really quiet. At first I was really disconcerted. I'd watch, the boys would be on bed, Jerome would be around them, they'd be watching Doctor Who and most of the time Doctor Who's talking about time and hit this, this either there's a lack of time or there's just too much time or he's, he's, he's sick and to death of time and here we are in, race, in a race against time and it just seemed like this really, to me, I'd sit at the back of the room and I'd look at Jerome and it just seemed so uncomfortable. I'd just feel really uncomfortable every time that he said the word time. And, but Jerome didn't have that perception of Doctor Who. It, it, it came about and we were watching um, it's the Van Gogh episode. It was really powerful and it was... Um, in, in brief, Doctor Who goes back in time. He's discovered a, a, an image in a painting that indicates that Van Gogh had seen some alien species and so he had to go back in time to find Van Gogh and determine where this alien came from, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a bit of a mystery around at the end of the episode, Doctor Who and Van Gogh and his Doctor Who's companions, travelling companions who'd made friends with him. And, and as a gift, Doctor Who decides to take Van Gogh in his pain and personal mental anguish um, because he, nobody understood his work and the importance of his work and, and he takes him to the future and he takes him as a gift to the, um, oh, which the Tate and there's an exhibition of Van Gogh's work there and there are people queued up, lined up, and they walk to the front and they get into this exhibition. And he takes Van Gogh to this, oh, uh, it wouldn't have been a curator, but someone who was manning the exhibition, and he says, could you please tell us the significance of Van Gogh's work? And this, this e e exhibition guide 
says he would have to be single-handedly the most, the greatest influence on modern art. And it's this moment where the camera moves around Van Gogh and he, he he's just becomes aware that it's irrelevant what he does with his work in the moment. It's what it's the legacy of it that it's this, it's this dawning awareness for him and he bursts into tears. Well, I thought it was Van Gogh on the screen bursting into tears and then I turned around and it was Jerome and he was weeping beside me and I moved the boys out of the room and it was this, it was the, such a deep, 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 deep um, just sadness and this great sense of he's just like, I, I, I'm never going to, I'm not going to finish my book, I'm not going to finish it. And I said to him, would you trust me to finish it for you? And, and he sat there and we, he kind of held my little finger and I sort of felt like his novel went through him, through his little finger into mine and into my hand and it kind of became my next task really was to finish his book for him. Mm. So after that point, I think he let go of what was his legacy, which was his written Opus Dei, you know, his big piece to humanity. He let go of that. And from that moment, he focused on the boys and he focused on family and he focused on that piece. And, and it was, he came to see legacy was family. Yeah. Yeah. That's mm. such a beautiful story. And he said to you, you said to me the other day, I'm going to be, a time lord oh yes he did i forgot that he did he was as i said to him at that point yeah and and i said uh, actually the, what came before that was um i said to him look you're going home you are going home yeah you you know that you're returning home it's just that you'll have to wait a little while for us to join you yeah and he said no, I'm going to be a time lord. I'm going yeah. to be a time lord. Time lord. I'm be lording it up all around the universe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's when. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that. It's true. He did say that, and it was caught me off guard at the time because he was he was it was sort of the end of the cry of despair and the beginning of him accepting that he you was know, moving just, into a timeless place. I just think so much of our suffering comes from thinking that we come to an end. And I think one of my missions mm-hmm. is uh, to show people, remind people that we don't, yeah, that, that, that even if you're mm. not in your physical body, you can still finish your book. <laughs> you can still write that book mm-hmm. through somebody. Yeah. My, I tell you what, I wake up every morning for the year after he died, it was I woke up to write the book, write the book, write the book. Did you write it? Write the book. <laughs> Well, yeah, because the weirdest thing is, I mean, this is even funny. Well, it's not, but it's a peculiar life, right? So I decide to take his manuscript, which is because the manuscript of the blog he wrote, someone was interested in publishing it. So I took it in and I also knew this person well enough and they'd heard that Jerome had been writing this novel and Jerome had mentioned this novel in his blog. So right. there'd been a bit of a you know, summary of it. And this person said, well, look, I'm really interested in, in the novel too, so bring that in. So I took the laptop in thinking I could just hand the laptop over because really all that was on the laptop was the novel. And at that point I was too emotional to really sit there and delve into all the pages of it and I, I wasn't ready to do that. So I thought, well, this mutual friend could do that and yeah. see if there was something to work with. Yeah. And we logged on and Jerome had password locked his friggin' novel. <laughs> Password lock it, right? <laughs> and I'm going, no, I don't believe it. No. And so in this, it was like the meeting had sort of come to an end. It was as if the meeting with this publisher had come to an end. And I, I don't know what possessed me. I put my hand on Jerome's laptop and moved it aside and I just went, I've got a story. And I just went, blah, 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 like I've just done with you. And he said, write it, go away and write it. You've got a book. If you can, the way you speak, you have a story that people will read. And I went, okay, I, I, can we get a ghostwriter? And he said, no, you can do it. I know you can do it. So I've nearly finished, I've nearly finished writing it. So he died, what, 18 months ago, and I've nearly finished. So, yeah, <laughs> crazy it'll days. Be, it'll be a great read. I tell you, it'll be a fantastic read. There's so many stories in you that we could talk all day. But listen, I, I, want, to, I want to get to another story that's happening at the moment. Um, 
you know, I'd really like to know how you got through the grief and stuff like that too, but you seem to be, you know, 18 months later, you seem to be on a mission and, you know, back on track and are you there? Are you there completely? Well, grief, well, yeah. No, I think grief is my kind of explanation. Like my, how I articulate grief is that, and, and I'm sure you, you know, we all have got a story of grief because, you know, we underestimate the, the importance of divorce as well. Divorce is a grief. You know, there are so many moments in your life where there's a loss of family unit, there's a loss of what you know to be or identify yourself, even career losses, that's a grief. Um, and there's a period of, you know, where you have to sit in stillness as your body forces you to and your executive faculties shut down. So your frontal cortex is unable to do basic things like shop for food, put dinner on the table, bills. You're just inept and you can't imagine that you would recover and, and manoeuvre your way back into some form of energy that could perform a duty or a task effectively. So I felt really unemployable at that time. So writing was a really terrific thing to do and I had a purpose and a deadline so I worked towards that. And during that period I had immense encounters with grief and and I described it as, you know, that's that flight and fight experience where you're kind of occupied by this sense of um, oh, it's adrenaline, really. And when in, in our day to day life, on a usual basis, your emotional response is your emotions are triggered by your external world most usually so it's an argument you've had a conversation something to do with love you know an experience with another human being however it is grief just arrives it's just it just it just circulates inside you as if you've just had an argument with someone or as if and it is this immense um sorry this it, it is this it feels like you've been um well, I called it, it's like being at a dinner party and having, um, you know, a SWAT team run through the front door and, and force everyone to hit the decks. You know, it's, it really is, like it just happens out of nowhere and you don't know what's going to trigger it and where you might be and all of a sudden you're... <gasps> and that for me was my experience of grief was, and that was in the early days and then I, came, I learned how to manage that and I learned that grief came with a message and grief came to teach me something and every time it arrived I realised that if I sat and stared at a white wall and did a flashback through a sequence of events I would arrive at a point where I could see something that caused an extra bump of adrenaline to move around my system. I go, okay, that's it. That's the moment I have to pay attention to and I'd focus on how I could shift that to um, a, a more... Um, to, to, a, to a resolution and I think the best example of it was one morning I was up at about I just woke up like boom four o'clock in the morning and I was like ah, I've got to put my shoes on I've got to run I've got to run I've got to run but I couldn't I had children asleep in the house so I paced up and down and up and down I couldn't work out what what is it which what what should I be looking at what should I be thinking about and at the clock the phone rang and it was my mum and she'd rung to say look I'm just calling to see how you are because I know it's a really difficult day today. And I said, how did you know? And she said, because it's your wedding anniversary. Um. And, and I went, oh, it's my wedding anniversary. I'd completely forgotten that it was my wedding anniversary on that day. And she said, it's going to be a difficult day. And I went, oh, God. But at least I, I had this, my body had carried it, they had a cellular knowledge of this, yeah. this important day, I think. And so I sat there for two hours staring at this white wall going, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, this isn't just an incident that I have to address, like the person when someone passes away, that can be quite haunting. This was actually needing to look into the journey of a marriage and I had to really sit there and ask myself, was he loved? Had I really loved him? Had he been loved? And had he lived a full life and had I been the wife that he needed and had I, you know, could I have done more? And yes, I should have. And, you know, I really gave myself a hard time in this sort of assessment of this moment. And then all of a sudden I realised my marriage is over. Like it hadn't occurred to me that my marriage was over. My marriage is over. My marriage is over. And then all of a sudden I realised, but it's the beginning of my marriage to myself. And it was in the moment that I realised it was now the marriage and a commitment to myself the whole heaviness and adrenaline of grief just dissolved. There you go. I just, 
it just went, yeah. And so I practiced that from that moment on every time one of those you know, scenarios occurred where my I felt I'd been held hostage I go right okay look at it what could it be what could it be and I'd I'd, I'd, I'd give myself the time to really flip it you know flip it turn it around so that it had new a, a message with a past that had a new purpose yeah mm-hmm. that's how I worked through my grief oh, the contrasts of life you know, the dramas of life bring mm. so many gifts if we will receive. So many, mm. so many, mm. um, you know, gifts on the road back home. Just, yeah, so many gifts. Yeah. Look, okay. Mm. Um, grief, yeah. So I want to talk about what's happening, what you're up to now because you, there's no stopping you. Mm. No stopping this gal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it was interesting because thank you for asking what I'm up to now. I mean, if you told me a year ago that I'd be doing this, I wouldn't have believed you. I wouldn't have believed that I'd have the ability to execute a project of this scale at this stage. You know, I, I really should be doing something quite simple probably and I think it's probably caused me a little bit of post-traumatic stress because you know you said my central nervous system has really been given a run for its money so I have to be quite gentle with it but no I am um, what as as Jerome and was dying I decided to sell the family home it became the most sensible thing to do to finance our circumstances and so all of a sudden you're a little bit rudderless and after he died, I felt a great this grieving around losing the family home as well. And a, an old colleague of mine called asking if I'd like to come and work as a contractor for an organisation called Habitat for Humanity. And interestingly enough, a bit like Deborah Lee with the adoption awareness with my son becoming an orphan, and here I am now working for sustainable, an organisation that builds houses for people living in poverty. And I'm thinking, okay, so now I'm going to go and build houses for people living in poverty and I don't have one myself. And... And I, at the time, thought, oh, God, it's fascinating how it all mirrors, you know. It all kind of reflects back to you what you think you've lost. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. And so, so, I, so I go to South Africa was the first trip and I decided to take Ethan with me and I decided that he would come with me and we'd go and live in a slum in the foothills of South Africa and, and everyone said, are you on crack? Are you mad? <laughs> this is this child's just been through, you know, blah, 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 blah. First you were going to be and then your father and then and now you're going to take him to Africa to live in a slum? And I said, well, that's I, I what I'm doing, so he may as well come with. And he was like, okay, well, so long as nothing awful happens. So we arrive into um, this extraordinary temporary settlement and Ethan comes with me and I'm with um, an actress who was working there at the time and we go and do an investigative piece on um, migration and how people have crossed borders and they've come from Malawi, they've come from you know, in search of work and they've had to leave families behind. And so I've tasked Ethan with finding children and, in, and interviewing them and then reporting on their stories to camera. And he's stepping into their homes. He, and then we're talking temporary shelters. We're talking, we're talking no toilets. We're not talking, we're talking land that doesn't have sewerage. It doesn't have, you know, water access. It doesn't have electricity. It's, we're talking really, and it's 6,000 people mm-hmm. where they're living on top of each other. And it's intense. And he coped with it really, really well. And, and it was the beginning of me returning to work. So that was in January this, this year. And we produced this piece and, it was interesting on the plane home. I said to him, "So, you know, what were your learnings, and what did you what did you take from it?" He said, "I just, I'm really ashamed. I'm really ashamed." And I said, "What?" And he said, "I took advantage of grief." He said, "I really feel like I took advantage of grief." And he said, "Because my story's not that big a deal. It's everywhere. It's just a big deal in my suburb, but out there." It's it like he'd met with these kids who lost parents, parents who left children behind. He, he was like, oh, I really feel like I've taken advantage of the kindness of of people. So that was a big turning point for him. It really put Huge. his story into perspective. Massive, massive, massive. And massive. we talk about it. Yeah, yeah. He he really had and, and for me, 
I was able to come home and see that I could pay for my parking, I could, I could pay for the roof over my head, I had skills and capabilities. And so I became kind of really interested in sustainable housing and I decided that I wanted to continue on and do more. And I came into, I was at a lunch with a really good friend of mine, Suze DiMarchi, who's the um, lead singer of a band called The Baby Animals. And she'd written this song called Homeless. And she has the tattoo, Home, written on. And this is what I love about the work I do. I don't have to search very far for someone to come and stand next to me. I always say, bring it through my front door, bring it through my front door, bring it through my front door. And usually it comes through my front door. In this case, it was at a lunch. And um, and she just said, here, take this song, do what you can with it, which we did. And and then she said, what else can I do? And I said, well, why don't you come to Indonesia with me? We'll go and I'll take you on a trip. So we went out. We did a trip. She became absolutely galvanized and she said well I'm about to do this um national tour 25th anniversary and she said why don't we do a campaign and we sort of devised this well why don't we come back and bring volunteers and build 25 homes in this Indonesian village and it was like yeah why don't we do that so no well, not nobody can you believe it no one said no <laughs> no one said no <laughs> least of all us well no one said oh that's do you think or, or, you know, and we, we just went, yeah, well, we're going to bring, and I said, okay, so for Habitat for Humanity, it requires 12 people to build a house. And we're not talking, we're not talking a complicated house, a simple house, just four walls and a roof and <clears throat> fundraise for that. And you fundraise $1,500 and through your own network. And then that's sent ahead of you to purchase your building materials and um, we're negotiating deals with Qantas and various places so that it's super cheap to get there and it's super cheap to stay there in a lovely five-star hotel. But you really are going up into this um, very re remote sort of community every day for five days to build a house. So 12 people to build a house. So the volunteers are coming in. Um, it's very open my heart. It warms my heart to think that you can dream something up and that people, complete strangers respond to it and that Suze and I are going to be leading an army of people out to Indonesia in October. So October the 22nd to the 29th, we take, we take everyone off to build these houses. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. Uh, look, uh, your mum said this. I'm mad. I'm completely mad. <laughs> no, no, your mum said this to me years ago, a few years ago. We were out on Pitwater on her little boat, you know, because she was living out on the island there. And um, we were talking about times, different times and in different stages through the ages. And she said, you know what the time is right now? And I said, what she said, she said, it's the time of making a difference. Like everyone feels like they want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Like would they all wanted to fix their problems at one stage and talk about their problems. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, at one stage there was psychology, it was all about me. And, and I think that we're in the age of making a difference. We have to be because we're heading so quickly you know, in the direction of extinction if we don't start connecting mm. and making a difference. So I think it's just perfect timing, you know, like where people are wanting to know how they can make a difference in the world and to others and, and mm. you're creating a platform to really have them fulfil that desire within them. I think it's, you know, I think mm. it's big. It's the era of the difference makers, especially the young kids that are coming through. They they know they want to, they know they want to, help humanity in some way you know it's spirituality in action so to speak it's not just about finding mm -hmm. yourself anymore it's about how can you put what you know into action and and be a global community and help each other so yeah congratulations i know and look my dog agrees with you my dog's just been <laughs> cheering you on there in the background so excuse that but he he always hypes up at the most salient point and I think you're absolutely right it is and it's a generation you know when I was going through university no one talked to me about doing international aid it was it wasn't on the curriculum at all and he said woof and um you know I think there's kids out there now who who it's it's just part of their that they're raised with this idea that it's a possibility and they don't question it yeah mm. yeah so people can get involved by um, they can they can register through um, www.rockthehouse.org.au and we called it Rock the House because we'll be taking musicians out there'll be performances it's we are going to rock the house while we're there um, and like I said you know fifteen and up <laughs> he says yeah <laughs> fifteen and up and no building skills required and 
look, I just think it's going to be, it's, it's very rare in my experience. I've often come back from my trips and people say, I want to come with you. When can I come with you? I want to do it too. I want to come. I want exactly. to come. And this is actually the most authentic oh, experience yeah. of transforming someone's life and seeing the values you have in your own life that you take for granted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's powerful, interesting because home is such an important place for me. I just love my home. And yeah. uh, I've never actually owned my own home. It's been a long-held desire, but I've always lived in beautiful homes. And I, I figure, you yeah. know, it's not really about owning anything. It's just about feeling at home wherever you are. I had a, you know, Michael, who I was telling you about, get story, mm. who was staying with me. He's on his nomadic journey for that reason exactly, to feel at home wherever you are. But, you know, to be able to provide a home... <laughs> For someone who has no home is a beautiful thing. It's just, you know, even if it's a it's, it's, it is. And I think it, it, it was brought home to me when I was standing with an 85-year-old woman who'd been born and raised in, you would call it a shed, really. It was the walls were not embedded in the earth. And I said to her, you know, how you've lived here for 85 years. How has your home changed in that time? And she said, well, every time there's a storm, I rebuild it. And I realised, you know, you know, I just, I, it, it's, you can visit it, you can see it, but you need to, you need to spend time in it to understand the, that to have a, a safe and secure home, it's, it actually is what breaks the cycle of poverty because you can yeah. then provide an education, you can, then you can have a, a you can, it, it's a microeconomic kind of growth can happen you can have a business from home um there is security i mean i've met a family who there's three daughters and they have to take it in turns to do their homework because there's only one place where they get natural light in the house mm -hmm. and it's not really a house it's a dirt packed floor but there's just one little you know portal there's no window but there's there's a, a gap in the wood where the kind of shine, sunlight shines through and that's where they and the rest of their homework they're doing chalk on the on the walls and on outside, so they do their maths outside. Determined to learn, determined to learn. And I'm thinking, God, private school fees, crazy. It's just really crazy when you think, you know. I know. kids out there you with know, dog I'm walk, a, determined to learn. People are, are stressing out, worrying about paying $50,000 a year to put their kids to private school and some kids are looking for some light to write a chalk, on a chalk. Sunlight. Board, you know, some sunlight oh. to actually see. Oh. That, what they're writing in chalk it's yeah. you know i know it's a crazy world we live in the imbalance is like out of control but at the same time it does offer uh, it does offer us vast variety in ways in which we can contribute you know we can contribute yeah. to each other and feel that global community and feel like you're one with your brothers and sisters and i often think very different i do think what you, yeah i think about um, I was talking to the CEO of Grant Thornton recently and he took 120 leaders from his organisation out to build 10 houses in Cambodia and and he said it changed, it absolutely changed his leadership the, the team and the way they co collaborate, the way they work together, they tr the trust they have for one another because it was, a, it was about teamwork in the end and what they thought they were, going to, they were going to help others and in actual fact they came home transformed themselves. Yeah. It is really quite, um, and that's the experience I've had with the trips I've made and the places I've met. Each trip and each experience I've met somebody who has, shared a story or invited me into their home or given me an insight into a world that is so wildly different and yet it's really about the acceptance. Once you accept the circumstances, there's great peace within all of those people I've met, you know, and it was a really great lesson for me. And I remember a woman in Malawi, I had an incredible experience with a woman in Malawi um, and, and, and she said, God wills it. God wills it. And I said to her, mm, do you think, you know, I was trying to communicate through a translator that, uh, do you, and, she, and, and, and the translator said to me, it is necessary to believe that God wills it because it is easier to accept it. And I could see, because I'm not someone who comes from a, a place of organised religion, it was my first experience of understanding its value. Because if 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 you were to if you could if you could comprehend that your circumstances were a result of your own 
kind of desires and your own you know wishes and in environments like that it's too hard to comprehend it's just too hard you know mm. so i Look, i can see a, that's how a whole, that's another a rabbit hole we could go down but we've been talking for ages so i need to oh, finish I know. This up. but you know because you know deliberate creations mm. a co-creative process with you and your soul and, you know, people talk about God mm. and it's the same as soul. I mean, who we are as non-physical, mm. active as non-physical beings are making decisions and desires and we have, you know, we, we want to experience something. And so from that perspective, sometimes we want to experience this extreme poverty and this, these circumstances because that's what the soul is up to, you know, that's what we're up to. And from our perspective, from a mm. human perspective, especially someone that's lived in comfort and luxury, it's un, it's unimaginable. It's unfathomable that anyone would want that in any way. So that's a whole another rabbit hole. But um, oh, darling, it is, it is. And when you're talking to people who li- li- literally living in the Middle Ages, who you know they don't they don't even have a grade two education, there is such a disparity between your your appreciation of. Use the spiritual world within, and yeah, look, I, that's also what I've written about too. It, it is, I mean, I've that has been another massive journey. Understanding I've had organised religion in the workplace right through to yeah, it, that's a whole other piece. You're right. It <laughs> it's a conversation oh, for another day when our tech is better because the tech <laughs> has been fabulous, bit blurry, bit scratchy. Uh-huh. But it's been such a joy, such such a beautiful conversation talking with you today, Ellie. Thank and so. You. Really, I suppose we need to we need to check back in with you, get some better tech happening when you've done your book. And we'll do this again when you've done your book. Yeah. Yeah, that would be book. great. And yeah, um, absolutely. And yeah, get some people on board. So it's rock the house. Rockthehouse.org.au. And apologize for my dog in the background. Um, I guess I should let him outside. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying time to finish. Time's up. Time's up. This is over now. Yeah. <laughs> so right. if people Thank feel you. like they want to jump on board, you are asking people to raise fifteen hundred, fifteen thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, fifteen hundred dollars per person per volunteer um, through social networking. Fifteen hundred, not then, much. You mean fifteen thousand, don't you? 15, no. Fifteen hundred. No, fifteen hundred per person. Per yeah, person. one thousand five hundred per person. That's not much. That's easy. That's easy to do. So you would have twelve people building a house. So each of those people raised fifteen hundred dollars, and then you've got your flights, and you've got. So we, like I said before, Qantas are keen to um, come on and do you know discounted vouchers, and then we've done a deal with the hotel and the restaurants where for seven hundred dollars for the week, that's your five star accommodation, all your meals, all your transfers. You don't have to put your hand in your pocket except for a glass of wine. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And so you actually go there. So you do hundred dollars fundraising, and you build the house. Yeah, and and it'll be a, yeah, it'll yeah. be a transformative yeah. experience as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It will be. It will be. It will be. Sign me up, baby. Keep you posted. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> come with. It will be fun. I'm coming. Have a great time. I'm coming. October, yeah. right? Oh, do. Do, do. Yeah. So we, we <laughs> registrations close July the twenty second. Okay, so that we so can get all the building good. material. Yeah. Yeah. So people need to have their 1500 yeah, raised they're... by July the 22nd. By August, by the end of August. So they registered by July the 22nd, fundraised by the end of August. Okay. So that we can get the materials, all the building materials to the build site by October. Mm. Fantastic. Mm. Ellie, it's been such a joy. Mm. Thank you so much. Blessings Thank to you. you. Thanks for listening and we'll speak soon. Take care. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us for another enlightened conversation on Accentuate the Positive. If you would like spiritual guidance from my guides, Blissful Beings, go to karenswain.com for a reading or to listen to more enlightened thought leaders share their wisdom. Go to the listen page on karenswain.com and choose who you want to listen to. All the podcasts are also available on iTunes. Remember to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, we're there. Until next time, bye for now. Like that's what you want